Good afternoon. Welcome to Cash Flow Strategies, uh, the first event in the 2021 uh, Gulf Capital SME Insights Live series of webinars. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Richard Thompson. I'm the Editorial Director of Mead, and I will be the moderator for today's discussion. Um, the, today's event is, as I mentioned, the first in a series of four webinars that will form the uh, 2021 programme of the Gulf Capital SME Insights Live series. And the purpose of this programme is to provide knowledge, to provide insights, and hopefully to provide some inspiration for small and medium-sized businesses in the UAE and in the GCC after uh, you know, the past 18 months uh, of what have been incredibly difficult times for, for many of you. So I do invite you to get involved in the conversation, to send in your questions and to pass, in, pass on any comments or observations that you have. And let's try and create as much value out of the next 60 minutes as we possibly can. Um, the G, uh, Gulf Capital SME Insights Live series is part of a programme of events uh, that uh, Mead and Gulf Capital have been uh, delivering for 10 years now. This is our 10th anniversary, and they include the Gulf Capital SME uh, Awards, which will be held in November this year, and I will tell you about them later, and the uh, Gulf Capital SME Summit, which also takes place in November. Um, all of these are part of the, the same package to help small and medium-sized companies. So. Um, Stay tuned throughout the whole hour and you'll hear more about those other events. Uh, and I also would like to thank, in addition to Gulf Capital, our other uh, sponsors and partners. Uh, Cigna uh, is our health and well-being partner and FedEx Express is our logistics partner. So with Gulf Capital, Cigna and FedEx Express uh, on board, you know, that's how we're able to make these things happen. So thank you very much uh, to all three of them. Uh, the purpose of today's discussion, as I mentioned, it's been a tough time for every business, but none more so than small businesses over the past 18 months. Uh, I think cash flow management uh, and raising capital, uh, working and operational and investment capital is, is the number one challenge uh, facing many small companies. And the purpose of today's discussion is to look at uh, the issues, to discuss ideas and strategies for cash flow strategies for raising finance, for reducing your operating costs, etc. cetera. Um, we have a wonderful panel of speakers and I do encourage you to take the time uh, to send in a question and, and sort of pick their brains. I think that's enough for me as a setup. I'd like to now introduce uh, Omar Rifai, who is the Managing Director and Head of Growth Capital Solutions at Gulf Capital. Uh, Omar and Gulf Capital are our hosts for today's discussion and for the, the full series. Um, so Omar, thank you very much for being uh, Meet's partner again for the 10th year running and um, I'd be interested to hear some thoughts from you. Great, thank you Richard. Uh, we are very proud of Gulf Capital to be working with SME for 10 years uh, with the Meet uh, uh, on the SME sector for 10 years now. Uh, look, the SMEs uh, are the backbone of the economies that we invest in. And at Gulf Capital, we manage $2.5 billion and have been investing uh, across the Middle East and Africa for the better part 15 years uh, in over 30 companies. The majority of those companies uh, were SMEs at some point in their life, and uh, our investment had come at some point uh, in that journey. So uh, we are very uh, proud uh, to, to be uh, working uh, with Mead, and we hope that these uh, insights are, are helpful um, as SMEs try to find uh, better ways to manage their cash flows in the future and uh, catapult their growth into the next stage. Fantastic. Thank you, Omar. Absolutely. As, um, as both of us have now just said, this really is about trying to provide assistance and insights and inspiration for you, the small uh, businesses that are sort of trying to get through the challenges of today's marketplace. So please use the next hour, get your questions in, let's pick the brains of our, of our panel of experts. Uh, and I would like to now introduce our panel to you. We have a fantastic uh, group of uh, speakers today. Um, so uh, Peter Tavener is the uh, CFO and COO, the Chief Financial Officer and the Chief Operating Officer for Beehive Fintech. Uh, thank you 
again, Peter, for being part of this year's programme. It's always a pleasure. Uh, uh, Donna Benton is the founder and chief executive officer of the Benton Group. I'm sure many of you will uh, be very well aware of, of Donna. She's a very uh, well-known entrepreneur and uh, um, uh, mentor for many businesses in, in the UAE. So thank you, Donna, for your time today. It's great to have you. Uh, PK Gulati is the founder of the Assembly uh, and Smart Start Fund. Uh, PK has been on many panels with us before. Thank you again for giving us your time, PK. It's great to have you. Uh, and Omar Rifai, who we've just heard from, the Managing Director and Head of Growth Capital Solutions at Gulf Capital. Again, Omar, thank you very much for your time. I know how busy you are, uh, but I, I've got loads of questions for you because I know that um, from a Gulf Capital perspective, you, you will have seen so much over the past year, and it's going to be great to sort of find out how we can tease out some lessons from all of that. So thank you very much to all of you uh, for being with us. Peter, I'm going to start with you. Um, as, as I've mentioned, it's been a very tough year for everybody and particularly small companies. What is your view of where we are today? Where are the SMEs uh, at the middle of 2021 in terms of cash flow and financing? Thanks, Richard. Yeah, it, it's a good point. I mean, obviously, uh, SMEs have had a hard time, but to be honest, so have big corporates as well. Um, just to give the listeners a bit of background on what Beehive does, we're a, a digital lender purely to SMEs uh, here in the UAE, but also in Saudi as well. So we've been live in Saudi for about a year uh, where we partner with a bank. And in the UAE, we've been doing it here for about six, seven years. So we've seen a number of ups and downs. We saw the first, I guess, crash was here back in 14, 15, uh, when there was a lot of problem issues with SMEs, uh, and then also pre and post pandemic as well. And I think the, the overarching comment is that the economy is coming back. Uh, we're seeing um, you know, a very strong uptick in the clients we service. Uh, we certainly are lending more now than we were pre-pandemic, uh, and the quality of businesses we're seeing are also actually better than the ones we were seeing pre-pandemic as well, actually. So there's, 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 some, there's some really good businesses out there, and I think a lot of businesses actually are, the ones that have managed to pivot or survive, uh, re-baseline their cost base, actually are doing very, very well indeed. Um, there are still pinch points with debtors and payments, uh, particularly in sort of certain sectors. I don't think that's really changed at all pre and post. Uh, what we are seeing is a lot of businesses are now, well, when they have customers, they are now coming back and actually getting back onto decent payment schedules uh, and making payments again. Uh, I mean, if we look particularly, for example, at our loan book, for example, there was a live pre-pandemic, uh, we took a little bit of a, you know, as all the banks did, we kind of gave some of our customers uh, payment holidays, but most of those are now back on track again. Uh, and if you look at our loan book, we've issued since pandemic started, so since basically March, April time, uh, every single loan we've issued, we've issued since then has, has been exactly on installment sort of thing. So for those businesses that we, we, we backed kind of once the pandemic started are all performing really well. Um, I think there's a, there's a difference between what we're seeing in the UAE and what we're seeing in Saudi. Uh, in the UAE, uh, in the, if you look at the banks, they are now coming back into it, but they were quite quiet uh, earlier. Uh, they were mainly there to support good businesses and, and businesses that had troubles pre-pandemic, uh, they weren't giving too much support to. Um, but we're now seeing them kind of coming back into the market and lending again. Uh, that's mainly because most of the banks have been lending off their own balance sheet without really true, true government support. The government support is much, much more at the bank overall, overall level. You compare and contrast that with Saudi, for example, where the Saudi government has actually put new money into the market. Uh, and that's been funneled through predominantly through the banks. And so the banks have been aggressively going after SMEs, mainly because they can do with minimal risk, basically. Um, so overall, I think the, the, the general comment is that the SMEs we are seeing seem to be improving. I think everyone can see basically there's more traffic on the road. Um, and my wife, for example, has a, has, a, has a shoe business. I know she had our best every month last month. So yeah, things are, are starting up again. Um, and then you compare and contrast that and you also with the equity market, particularly for startups, because Beehive really only looks at kind of not mature, but earlier stage, but they're, they're trading SMEs, which have revenue and profit. And if you look on the equity side, you'll also see that there's a lot more money now coming around, again, particularly out of Saudi, and again, particularly fueled uh, 
uh, by the kind of government spending that's going in there as well. Fantastic. Well, I was making notes, Peter, as you were talking about what questions I might ask you, and I've got 10 questions to <laughs> ask you, so well done. Uh, that's a great way to start. And I do encourage everyone in the audience to, if you have questions for Peter or if any, any of our panelists, please send them in. I'll just pick on um, one of your comments for now, Peter, which is near the beginning. You, you talked about the quality of businesses that you are seeing uh, at the moment are better than they were previously. What, what do you mean by that? In what, in what way are they better and why? So the, the reason I think they're better is that, so, so we are always, we're, we're quite a conservative lender. Yeah, so we always target the SMEs. The position is that we're looking for the 20% best SMEs. You know, we can compete because at Beehive, we're faster and we're cheaper than the bank. So we know that our product is, without kind of bigging ourselves up, superior to, to what the banks can offer when you're comparing a one for one. And we're very much about um, rifle shooting for businesses rather than shotgunning. For businesses as well um, and I think what you, the quality we've seen is actually partly because a lot of the banks actually did close down for a bit you know, they are kind of coming out of hibernation again but they did close down therefore the good businesses that managed to survive and thrive during the uh, during, during the last year who are basically they're either maybe more e-com they're more digital they've been able to pivot their model they've actually just basically been a much stronger business those businesses that want to basically expand haven't had as many avenues to go and find the money. And therefore, we've actually filled into that breach uh, or stepped into that breach, let's say, um, during that period. So I think that's that's partly of it. I think also we, we've, we've also just been there for our customers anyway. We've given them good, good support. And I think the ones, again, that were customers before the pandemic, but then have again survived and built during the pandemic, Again, we're basically able to help them as well. And they've come back to us and appreciated the help we've given them as well. And just one quick question um, before we move on. In terms of your sort of uh, supply and demand for capital, so I, I, I take it from what you've said, you're seeing increasing demand for capital. Is it easy for you to, to find investors uh, or is that, you know, is there a shortage on that side? Uh, quite interesting, actually. So. If you look at our, our funding pre-pandemic, we were about 90% of our funding came from individuals. So people on this call uh, could be putting in as little as 100 dirhams, could be putting in a million dirhams, yeah? But they were equally, they were individuals. And we had about 10% of our book, which is institutional. Um, what we've seen during the pandemic and post is that in, to an extent hasn't purely flipped, but it's flipped a lot, yeah? So for example, um, we now have Emirates Development Bank lending directly over our platform to businesses. Um, we have uh, Riyadh Capital out of Saudi. Uh, they're lending directly to our businesses. Um, we also have uh, part of the Dubai SME, which is Mohammed bin Rashid Fund for SMEs. They're also lending directly. So between those three, we've actually got a couple more who are coming online as well. We found that actually, we, we actually have more capital, particularly for good quality businesses, uh, because most of these institutional investors are quite risk adverse. So they want to go into the top quality um, risk category. And we're finding for those, there's sufficient capital. And in reality, if you look at someone like the EDB relationship, you know, what we are is a distribution channel. And that's really all we are. Uh, and you compare and contrast that with Saudi, where we have the Saudi Development Bank, which is similar to the Emirates Development Bank here. Again, we are purely a channel for their cash. They have a mandate to put money into the market. They physically can't put the money in themselves. Therefore, we are a channel for them to get money into the market. And that's that's where I think uh, we see the big change is, is that is those capital pools, particularly institutional government pools, getting to market and needing a route to get there. Okay, that's, that's fascinating uh, insights into how things have changed. Thank you for that, Peter. And um, I can see we've got loads of questions already coming in. Keep your questions coming. Uh, once we've been around the panelists, we'll go to the, the Q&A session. Uh, and I'd like to move on to Donna Benton, founder and chief executive officer of uh, the Benton Group. Uh, Donna, thank you so much for your time. Uh, again, you, you give us so much of your time. Um, you. What are your thoughts on where small businesses find themselves? You know, the people that come to you for advice or to invest, mm -hmm. what are you seeing from them at the moment? And what are your thoughts on, on what they should be thinking about? Yeah, to be honest, um, Richard, I'm probably the opposite to all of the guys. <laughs> I'm one of the SMEs. I'm starting up again. So I 
coming from entertainer, I understand where that's at. And I think at the moment, entrepreneurship and SME is actually stronger than it's ever been. I think people have really had time to think about what they want to do during the pandemic. They've been at home with their families and they've really, you know, every that watch their money. Do they want to be corporate entrepreneur? Do they want to run their own business? So I think they're in that space where what next? And for those who are wanting to start their own business or in the middle of it or SME, I think there's three pillars um, that are really important when doing this. I think firstly, there are many, many people with great ideas, but they can't get any funding or they don't have the money. So that's probably one of the biggest um, that, that we have. And I have been one of those. So don't worry, I know how that feels. Secondly, it's weighing up, um, do you give away equity or do you get into debt? That is another big one as well, because they're both very, very different. And the third one, with either of them, to be honest, is how do you get that? How do you find a business partner and the funding? Or how do you go to Beehive and get money from, from them? So, and that is, you know, you need your passion, you need energy, you know, you have to your business inside and out. Figures, figures are so important. And I also believe that anyone investing in a company or an institution investing really wants to know what you're bringing to the party as well. Are you putting in any funding? Are you not taking salary for a year? How, how are you putting in? Is it time or money? And I think there are three pillars that um, are really important for the now for SMEs um, and also for the people who are wanting to be SMEs. Is it your, your sense that, um, you know, as Peter just talked about, the banks almost shut up shop for a period there. Um, <laughs> and we've had, you know, in different markets, the governments have stepped in to either, you know, ex allow extended loan periods or provide stimulus money. Um, is it your sense that there is, it's more difficult to get money at the moment because of the uncertainty from COVID or is there plenty of money and things are sort of going to loosen up quite quickly? Look, there's two ways. There are definitely people that are still investing, 100%. So don't give up, everyone. There are definitely people that have money, they want to invest, but they want to see the right investments and they want to see the right returns. That's what it is. So that there are people, if anything, there might be more than there was before. They're just watching their money a little bit more and they're investing in right companies, but also the right people running the companies as well. So definitely there is funding out there. You've just got to go and find it. It's okay. not going to come to you. You've got to go get it. Okay. And then um, just, uh, uh, we've got loads of questions coming in. I want to put this one uh, to you, Donna. I don't know if um, others might want to come in as well. So one of the issues facing SMEs, says the questioner, is uh, getting paid by clients. What advice can you provide to SMEs to guarantee getting paid by their customers on time? Um, this is perhaps happening because customers themselves are facing cash flow issues. Any thoughts? I, I don't know if this is something you've come across. Yeah, no, no. I do have many thoughts on this, to be honest. Firstly, as a company owner, you can never be scared to say no to somebody in a business. So you can't, one, look desperate. I need your money and, I don't know, pretend you're in, I don't know, whatever industry. But don't take their deal with no deposits because you may never get paid. Your cash flow is king. You have to at least get a 50% deposit to cover your costs. Otherwise, it's the quickest way your company is going to go under is cash flow. And if you get excited and go, wow, I've just got this 500,000 dirham deal. And now you've got to spend 300,000 on product to facilitate it, but they're not giving you a deposit. And then they go broke. Well, guess what? So do you, <laughs> because you've spent the 300. So um, in that way, you just have to, you have to try and be really strict. I know it's exciting to get deals, but if it's not secure, it's, if the deal is not secure enough for you to take, it's not worth taking. Okay. And, then and the one other thing is if you've already sorry, done the deal, just keep on the phone, ringing them, asking for the, asking for the money. Don't, Try, don't take no for an answer, you know, or try and figure out some terms with them or pay it off or there's always, where there's a problem, there's always a solution. Fantastic. One, one final question for you, Donna. Um, you mentioned in your comments about, you know, 
uh, debt versus equity. If you're, you know, if you're going to borrow or get an investor. Obviously, this is a massive topic. Just briefly, you know, when, when, when should you go to the banks and when should you seek an equity investor? Yeah, that, it's a tough one. It depends, actually. I actually really think it depends on the individual. So if you go into debt, you're really backing yourself um, because you're putting everything into it. You are the sounding board. You're going into debt. So you've got to pay it off. Your business model has to be solid. It has to be strong. And you've got 100% yourself. So that's amazing. Going into equity is a little bit less risk diverse. You have got some money coming in. You can play around with it a bit. Um, you're probably giving away a little bit more, though, because you're giving away equity, which could in turn be 100 times what the debt is on an exit in maybe five or seven years. So it really depends where you are as a person at the time, if you've got family, individual, what commitments and what you feel comfortable with. And is it, on the equity side, is the relationship element important or does that, I guess that depends on the role of the investor, if they're actively involved or not. Yeah, it's very important from my experience. I've done two acquisitions and you really have to figure out, is it just money that you want? and the other person just there for funding or do you want their advice along the way or do you want them to be active in the business so you have to really figure out what works for you at the same time but on any three of them you must have chemistry and you must have the same vision fantastic well donna thank you uh, very much for those comments if anyone has questions for donna or any of the other panelists keep them coming in i can see that we've got loads i'm going to struggle to to manage this uh, <laughs> The volume of questions but thank you donna um, no, thank you. sorry donna no thank you i was just saying <laughs> <laughs> um, i'll move on now to pk galati who is the founder uh, of the assembly and smart start fund pk thank you so much for your time today perhaps you could um, i mean I'll, I'll put the same question to you which is how do you see the sme landscape today in terms of cash flow in terms of raising capital in terms of costs um but also tell us a little bit about the Assembly and Smart Start Fund as well, what your sort of, what your skin in the game is. Thank you, Richard. Thank you very much for having me here. Um, I'm probably a bit different from others in the sense that I work usually with startups. We invest in startups, which are early stage, usually being the first check. And we are actively involved in the business. A lot of them turn out to be SMEs in the sense that they do not get the trajectory which we expect from a startup. But, you know, I see a landscape which is actually super positive at this point of time after having gone through what we went through. You know, when the pandemic hit, we had already been in a few quarters of recession already. I don't know if people remember that or not. You know, we were going through a recession, uh, you know, in fact, the, you know, the jury was out, is it really a recession or is it fully a recession or not a recession? But we were going through, you know, uh, a market which was actually looking uh, downwards in the sense that people were not ready to make more investments. People were coming into new into business, but they were finding the going very hard. And when the pandemic hit, it was super strange. Nobody had seen something like that. It was it was it was very strange. Something which started as a you know far away flu suddenly became something which the whole world was being impacted with, and it was coming to a standstill. And that uncertainty created a very you know, deep um, sense of reaction from most people. So even if businesses which were working well, the customers which were paying well, suddenly everybody went on the fence. So payments which were due didn't come in. You know, people who were about to write you a check for investment in equity or in debt was not writing that check and watching things, the space, you know, that's, that's what it became. And what that did was that actually brought everybody to a standstill. But let's see what happened after that. In a few months, everybody realized that world had to go on. And I believe the digital part of the world actually surprised everybody. Considering that we are having this session on a Zoom call, which was probably something which even me would not have thought of doing, uh, you know, a few years down the line. If you, somebody would have said a webinar, say, ah, nah, we do real events, we don't do webinars. And suddenly we realized that the whole world is going on. Majority of us are actually having our businesses working fully without having to step out. The only reason I step out is, you know, me being in Dubai, I can step out. That's the reason I, you know, prefer going out and having a real coffee with people and stuff like that. So that has changed everything. 
The few things that I have noticed is, you know, SMEs are always at the bottom end of lending, for example. Banks were always reluctant to lend to SMEs. And we can, uh, you know, we, we've seen so many years of that. You know, so if you were somebody who's not making a lot of profit, somebody who's not, you know, really churning out a lot of money, your chance of getting some, like, like, uh, like a high street bank loan or high uh, debt in any other form was almost impossible. What has changed now is some, uh, 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 you know, uh, a piece which I think Donna mentioned, the quality of new startups and ideas that I'm seeing is actually substantially better than what we saw before. They're far more investable. Sorry, can I, if I can just interrupt there, how, that three of you have now said that, and I find that very curious. It's only, I mean, 18 months, it's been a long, slow 18 months, but it's only 18 months. How can you have seen a, a quality, you know, a step change in the quality of startups? How, what, how can that happen? So I sit on the, you know, the selection committee of multiple, you know, such innovation centers, which actually take in new ideas and help, uh, you know, small businesses or new businesses come to life, like in five, for example. And there, you know, I have five years, people coming in, pitching ideas to you. The two big differences that I thought uh, I saw in the last one year is one, the number of them, which actually make past previous, you know, uh, selection uh, kind of filters and reach that is higher. Second, they are far more thought out ideas. It seems like people are spending more time thinking out their ideas and not doing an idea for the sake of an idea. And the third thing is, I think, you know, it's almost like, um, you know, you wake up one day and realize that you only have one life. So a lot of far more, you know, let's say capable people are taking that step of leaving a job and trying to do something on their own and are actually spending the time to build a robust model, thinking it through and bringing it forward. All this put together, you know, are real signals of the right kind of people actually coming in and trying to start their companies. That's interesting. I, I also wonder, um, you mentioned um, in your comments there, you know, about when people have shifted to digital and a lot of the startups, in fact, I have a question here, which I'll put to you in a moment. Um, a lot of the startups are tech. Uh, or it seems to me that a lot of the, you know, we're seeing that tech, and I'm just wondering if the, they're coming from a, a different position. And so the quality of the startups, because they're coming from that sort of tech point of view, maybe there's a, they're a bit more structured in their, when they go looking for money. Is uh, that a factor? Um, not exactly true, Richard, because uh, uh, the, the variety of like, you know, areas of business these startups come from are pretty substantially different. When I said, uh, when I mentioned, um, you know, digital was like even the use of digital in an SME, for example, like, like, you know, I have my plumber actually coming on a Zoom call, talking to me and asking me what is wrong with this before he comes and sends somebody or before he drives down, you know, that kind of stuff. So, you know, digital has helped every industry in that sense, okay. things which were not possible before schools, for example, you know, you know, I'm talking about primary schools and, you know, kids actually using far more digital than they were supposed yeah. to use. So there are very mainstream industries, medical, for example. Okay. You're, you're now, I have a question industry. for you, PK. Sorry to interrupt. The, um, the, uh, you mentioned that your focus is primarily on startups. And I have a question. This was actually submitted in advance of today's uh, discussion about startups. So I'll just read it out. Um, how, a st how can a startup get funding? If a startup uh, is in the idea stage and the the but the canvas is ready. Most startup funding seems to be for tech. Uh, this person is saying if the startup is into sustainable agriculture, what is the step that they can take? Or are there any particular investment groups uh, that focus in, you know, in this case, the agriculture sector? So I guess this is generally, how do I get money if I'm not a tech? Yeah, so, so, so again, uh, raising money is difficult. It's as simple as that. It's always been difficult. Donna mentioned it. You know, we've all gone through this. But what I see today is there are far more people ready to part their money earlier in, you know, in the life of a startup, in the sense at the angel level or at the seed level, which I believe this person is looking for. And agriculture tech or ag tech in general is actually pretty uh, high up these days in the agenda of investment. So, and more so in this region. In fact, I'm seeing uh, you know, getting anything which was of impact or that kind of, let's like, say, non-glamorous sector 
was almost impossible a few years ago. The amount of money that is being invested by early stage investors in, for example, vertical farms, in, in supporting um, you know, food security kind of ideas or food processing kind of ideas, or even things like what we call direct to consumer kind of brands, those kind of uh, you know, ideas are far more common than they were before. So there is appetite for that, Richard, there. Now, where can they go? I see more and more angel groups coming up now. The people of similar bent get together to invest. You see, uh, it was Im almost uh, impossible for a small time investment company to be formed in the various, various um, zones that we have because they were too expensive. So most of them have come with ideas which actually make it easy for people to kind of pool together and invest in a venture. So I believe there's more and more ideas which are coming forward, which will allow such uh, investments to be kind of undertaken in the region. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you very much, PK, for those for those comments. If anyone has questions, and I know that I do have a few already for PK or any of the other panelists, send them in. We've got half an hour to go, uh, and we'll get to all of the questions in a moment. Um, I would like to bring Omar back in. So Omar Rafai is the head of growth capital at Gulf Capital. Uh, our partner and host for today. Omar, thank you very much again for, uh, for, for uh, supporting this series and for over the past 10 years. Gulf Capital, so PK um, was talking there a lot about startups. Gulf Capital tends to look slightly uh, at more mature companies, uh, slightly bigger entities. What are you seeing? What are the changes that you've seen over the past 18 months? And where do we, what is, your view on where those companies find themselves today in terms of cash flow and capital raising? Sure, thank you, Richard. Yeah, so we um, we usually invest $10 million and above. So that, that puts us in the category of looking at the, the medium-sized business within the SME space. Uh, what we are seeing is that uh, there's a, a bifurcation. There are some of the companies that approach us um, that fit that profile that are uh, experiencing a level of pain that's just gonna be very difficult to overcome in the near term. And it has to do with what sector they operate in. Uh, a lot of the issues were mentioned. Their customers are not paying. You know, their customers are indirectly linked to say government expenditures or, or some sort of bank financing flowing through that system. Uh, and then on the other hand, you have uh, some companies that are exhibiting a, a lot of growth. And you know, it's no surprise they happen to be um, either in the tech space or in traditional sectors that were adopting some sort of uh, a technology angle to their business prior to the pandemic, or they very quickly at the onset of the pandemic started pivoting quick into technology. So the most basic being a retailer who is pushing very aggressively in e-commerce just to, to make things a little simple for people to comprehend. Um, what we are, that's how we're seeing uh, uh, the, our pipeline shape up in that space. We are seeing, however, um, some companies get a little bit smarter about how they present themselves when they come looking for financing. Um, and I do encourage any SME, irrespective of what sector they're in and what their growth rates are like or what kind of cash flow positions there are, is to spend more time uh, positioning uh, their company um, so that it is easy for the investor or the financier to understand what drives the business and what may be driving uh, recovery in the business going forward uh, or the potential to generate cash flows going forward, which is very important whether you are speaking to uh, a provider of equity or a, a provider of debt. Um, the other thing I, I would just note, um, somewhat related to your question, but somewhat not, and I'm happy somebody brought it up. Uh, there is a lot of equity out there for SMEs at different stages, provided there is a very good idea and uh, the founders are uh, capable of executing it, either because they have the requisite experience or because they have built a team around them that can execute it. Um, and the question of, you know, should I take on equity or debt also should be linked to what sector you're operating in. There might be some cheap debt available for you. Uh, however, it, that may not be suitable for your situation if you have a business that's slightly if, volatile. If, could you just, if you could just explain that a little bit, Omar. So sure. banks, what you're saying is that banks have ring fenced pots of money and some, some might be more overused or overstretched and some might be more available. Is that, is that what you're saying? Yeah, I'll give you, I'll give you a basic example. A lot of banks, you know, they, they do ignore the SME space. We know that everybody was aware of that. Um, but some of them do prefer, prefer uh, lending to companies that are um, heavy on assets. They have a bunch of assets, makes the bank's underwriting process very easy. Um, and a business that is sitting on some assets may think that it's a better idea to go out there and get debt instead of then myself and raise equity. 
Well, that may not be the best thing to do if your cash flow profile isn't necessarily great over the next two to three years. You might have the assets, uh, but, but at the end, the value of those assets are only linked to their ability to generate cash for you to service your debt. And so these are the types of situations where sometimes there, there's a mismatch and the banks go to those types of SMEs, lend them. A year later, that SME doesn't have the cash to repay the bank. Um, and the SME looks at the bank and says, well, you have collateral over my assets. And the bank says, well, those assets aren't worth as much as I thought. So in that type of situation where it may seem obvious that debt should be the way to go because debt is available, uh, that is not necessarily the best thing to do in the long run. In the long run, it might be better to sit there and say, bring in a little bit of equity. Okay, uh, thank you, Omar. Now I've got several questions for you also. Uh, uh, one I would like to ask you, um, just when you were talking there, it sounded like you maybe look at potential investment opportunities differently now to how you might have looked at them 18 months ago. So I'm just curious about what what was in my mind was this idea of resilience. You know, we've seen the impact of a, a shock and the impact of the pandemic on supply chains and, and things like that. So do you now look at investment opportunities and companies with a different perspective with regard to resilience, not just about revenues and costs. And, and then the other factor that relates to this is things like we hear a lot about ESG, about environmental, societal and um, governance factors for investors. Is that another change? You know, so how, how has your, how do you, how has you, the way you assess investment opportunities changed? Yeah, thanks, Richard. I'm happy you mentioned this um, because this is true of us and true of a, a lot of potential providers of capital. So at Gulf Capital, we are a thematic investor. We are very much sector focused now um, and have been pivoting towards sector uh, focus for the better part of the last four or five years out of our, our 16 year uh, history. The sectors we focus on are tech, healthcare, um, uh, business services, uh, sustainability, and to a certain degree, depending on the geography, consumer. Uh, by nature, a lot of those happen to be ESG friendly and compliance. Uh, that wasn't the main reason we focused on those space. It was one of the reasons. Uh, the main reason was just these are the sectors of the future. These are the sectors within the markets that we focus on that actually need capital um, and, and, are, and are growing. So when it comes to resiliency, we think all of them have resilience. Uh, but I do think the resiliency of the business is a combination of the sector it operates in, the management team that's running it, um, and uh, obviously the strategy that's being executed. Okay, and then a couple of, let's call them technical questions. One is uh, that was sent in by a questioner before uh, in advance of the event. It relates to VAT and um, taxes. And I don't know, I don't know if Omar, if this is for you or for one of the other panelists. How do you tackle VAT and other applicable taxes while restructuring debt? So it's quite a technical question, and I don't know if anyone on the panel is able to answer that. Any any thoughts, uh, Omar? I'll start with you. Maybe Peter has a thought on this as well. But I, I was going to hand this over to, to Peter. Okay. Uh, we <laughs> there any thoughts? Fortunately, never had to restructure uh, any debt. Yeah. VAT yeah. I must confess that that's, that's unfortunately not a skill set of mine. <laughs> okay. Well, I think it's that's fair enough. If it's if it's beyond us, I apologise to the questioner. We 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 can try and follow up um, separately. Omar, I had one more question for you, which relates to inflation. So we've heard over you know, the past six months, we've seen um, a spike in commodities prices around the world due to the sort of supply chain bottlenecks. We're also now seeing warnings of consumer price inflation on the back of stimulus spending and you know, the roaring 20s everyone's talking about. So how should, is this a worry for, for investors? Will this affect SMEs? Should we be worried about inflation? I'll tell you from the investment perspective, um, one of the things we're worried about, and, and this is good if you are an SME in a fast growing business, we think there's inflation and valuation out there um, as a result of uh, a lot of the uh, inflation. But yes, this is a worry to a certain degree. I mean, macroeconomic theory obviously points to all the stimulus being in resulting in inflation. I think um, we do keep an eye on it. Uh, the, the, the pitfalls are that the the expectations of our investors that give us money in terms of the returns uh, will also have an impact on the price that we're willing to pay when we invest in a business uh, to the extent they are looking for higher returns to mitigate against what they perceive is inflationary risk in the future. That means that the investor universe that's managing that money 
uh, has to um, also adjust how they view valuations when they invest in businesses. And presumably um, on the debt side, there is, if inflation is looking worrying, there's a risk of infl uh, interest rates um, going up. Correct. And that if you are issuing a, uh, let's say we're, we're doing a MES deal, for instance, today you have low rates out there that are artificially um, low because of a lot of stimulus, but then you have the risk of inflation going forward. It becomes very difficult to uh, fix the rate of return on some sort of a debt instrument, knowing that in the future over a five-year investment horizon, uh, inflation may make the world uh, a little bit more different and you might be underpricing it. Okay, thank you. Now, does anyone else want to uh, pass any comments on the inflation question? Peter? Uh, only that I think uh, the, the, the critical point about inflation is, I think as, as Omar's kind of hinted at, is, is ultimately it, it'll impact interest rates. So therefore, taking debt on now, which has a floating charge or basically attached with to a variable charge, means that basically rates will go up probably in 2023. And that's, that's where the US is basically focusing on increasing rates. Therefore, interest rates will go up. Short term gain, though, obviously, is the fact that, that, that actually businesses can, can, can gain from inflation as well, and therefore hence sell more and get ahead of the curve. So uh, inflation isn't a bad thing, as long as it's kept in check, where the dangers happened historically is that, in particular this region, is that there's been inflation, let's say, in the US, which hasn't mirrored here. There's been effectively deflation here. But because of the pegging of the dirham to the dollar, interest rates have still had to go up here. And that, that's where there's a danger, where there's, a, uh, there's, a, there's a, a split between what the US and the rest of the world is doing and what's happening here. Uh, as long as the two of those are aligned and actually yeah. inflation at a relatively low level isn't, so isn't a bad thing at all. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to go now to the questions. Um, we've got about 20 minutes remaining. Uh, I'm just going to go through them. I apologize to the panelists if it's a bit random, but you know, we'll just take it as it comes. Uh, the first one here to the board. So uh, maybe Donna, if I come to you first, what are the three most relevant things you want to see in a business plan when asking for funding and what recommendations do you have to get them right? Oh, for me, if I was investing in a company, they would need to present me with uh, obviously a feasibility, know their business inside and out and have all their commercials done. I, as I said before, I want to know what they're putting in as well, because I think no risk, no reward. So starting up a business, there is an element of risk. It can't be too easy. So there has to be something that comes in it from their side as well. And at the end of the day, bottom line, it has to be a good idea. It, it has to have legs, as we'd say. It's to sort of capture your imagination, I suppose, and inspire you. Yeah. And for me personally, it generally would have to be something that I'm interested in. And if I could help in any way, or you know, I always say, you know, if someone came to me with spare tyres, I wouldn't really be interested because spare tyres don't really float my boat. Uh, have, you, <laughs> have you actually done that when, you, you know, someone's come with a good plan and you've thought, actually, I, I, I can't get excited about this or I don't have the expertise in this area. Yeah. You know, yeah. Sometimes it's not about, I know a lot of people is maybe I'm a bit different. It's not about just the return sometimes. It's about how you can help and have that passion and the energy. Yeah. If you're interested in something, well, you're going to work harder at it and be more interested. So if you're not, well, you're not. <laughs> so that's a pretty simple formula. I'm always curious, how, if, I, if I was a, 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 an entrepreneur and I come to someone like you, you know, for investment, how much can I demand of your time? You know, obviously I, I want your money. <laughs> but I'm a nice but, person, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what, how does that work? I mean, get, yeah. should... Um, the borrowing company feel that they they just have they can ask for whatever they want and just have to accept no as an answer sometimes yeah no look generally uh, it's a bit harder because we also have our own startups as well yeah so i'm really big on startups also but i also like investing in other startups because i know what it's like where i was one day 
So I'll always give time where I can. That is definitely, um, definitely it. I have a few things that are going on at the moment that's coming the rest of the year. But then there's also a point where you can't invest in everything. And there has yeah. to be a cutoff where, like, okay, well, our investment's sort of done for this year. So, you know, we can look at um, 2022, but not right at this moment, maybe Q4. And it's just, it's time management, to be honest. Yeah. And it's executing in a nice way where you're at with people and encouraging them along the way as well. It must be it must be incredibly difficult to juggle that kind of, you know, you get involved because you're passionate about it or you believe in it. And at the same yeah. time, you've got these other things. But, okay, thank you for that. Now, PK, uh, we have a question here, um, which you touched on a little bit. So I'll just read it out. Cash flow being a challenge for startups, what solution exists to overcome that difficulty at a very competitive rate? So yeah, <laughs> keeping your costs down. Listen, uh, I always tell people that, you know, invoices, especially when you're a early stage company, invoices that you need to pay come six months earlier, invoices people need to pay you come six months late. So always, you know, this, this gap always exists. You know, there's something which goes wrong, whichever plan that you have. In the case of startups, it's usually easier to raise capital in the form of equity. And my suggestion usually is if you have a good idea, you have a good team and you see interest in investment raise over raise raise more money raise enough money so that you don't reach a point richard that you're talking about where you don't have enough money to pay building the company use the early time to build a robust company so that you're in a place where you are able to find debt or find cash flow or from uh, selling product which actually takes care of you so this is the best way to do that if you're a startup now you have options like venture debt coming in venture debt is for companies which do create cash flow but that cash flow is not enough to take, take them to profitability where investors like vcs will actually say hey you know what don't dilute further but take some debt which you service from the cash flow you, you get at the same time continuing building the company so options like that are now available in this market so those could be areas which you could look at richard but it all depends on if you're actually creating cash flow in the sense that you're actually getting revenue into the company. A lot of startups actually have a far bigger curve before they become revenue positive. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Omar, I've got a question here and I, I, don't know, I don't know if we can answer that in this panel. It relates to Africa. Uh, so the questioner is just asking about, um, are there any characteristics for the African market or for startups, does Gulf Capital get involved in in Africa at all? Uh, we do get involved uh, in Africa, and uh, the pain points of an SME uh, in some of those geographies are similar to the pain points uh, they have here. Uh, I would argue that uh, in many African countries, there's less access to um, early stage liquidity in the form of family offices or syndicates of angels or, or seed uh, stage and pre-seed stage VC firms. Um, however, there is more access to perhaps some uh, fintech solutions uh, because certain countries in Africa have gotten a little bit ahead of the curve and finding creative ways to uh, provide fintech to, uh, to SMEs. Obviously, those are kind of two immediate differences that come to mind. Okay, thank you. And I have another question here, which I'll put to you also, Omar. I don't know if I don't know if this is um, appropriate for this panel or not, but how can SMEs pull out from a holding company and get their own bank facilities? So I'm guessing this is where they've got an investor and they want to buy back or something. I don't, I don't quite understand the question, but does that, can you answer that in any way? Does it make sense? I'm not sure what it is, but it sounds like uh, they're trying to ring fence uh, subsidiary uh, and raise financing on that subsidiary's balance sheet. Um, <clears throat> it's just an administrative task. It's more for a, a lawyer to discuss, but it's feasible. We've seen people do that before, which is basically try to uh, create a more cleaner balance sheet from one of the subsidiaries that might be independent uh, from any linkages to debt at the holding company so that uh, they could um, borrow money at that level. And, and that's something we do see sometimes. Okay, so if- It might also be, sorry, it might also just be- Yeah, more, sure. As I said, I imagine actually it might be more just pure admin. Banks here struggle massively where there's a top co outside the UEE. You know, so, so basically if you've got a straightforward ownership where one, two, three, or four, let's say individuals own a company, it's very straightforward. As soon as you put a Cayman or a BVI Topco onto it, 
then a lot of banks here struggle significantly with opening a bank account because basically you have to go the whole way back to the ultimate beneficial owner and, and above that. Um, so I imagine that's actually, is, is probably actually, that's probably the issue. Um, some banks are better at it, some banks are not, but in reality, it's just having all the paperwork. That's the only way, unfortunately, you can do that, short of opening a brand new company, which is okay. probably not something you want to do either because it's well, very expensive. That's been just to, to, the, to the person, uh, so, I mean, I thank you both Omar and Peter for, for your answers there. To the person who submitted the question, if I didn't do your question justice, could you please send a, a clarification? Hopefully we covered it. If we didn't, send in um, a clarification. Uh, now, um, PK, I think I'll put this one to you, but maybe others might come in. So the questioner says, we are a startup engineering company and we have a contract to complete, but we have some cash flow issues. Where can we obtain a loan, please? So, <laughs> so <laughs> I, I mean, obviously the bank would be the first place, I suppose, if it's a specific loan, but any thoughts on a company in that situation, they've got a contract that they need to fulfill. You know, by definition, uh, Richard, uh, when you're reading the question, it seems like a services company. It seems to have a contract of services to deliver. This is what it feels like rather than a startup building a okay. product or a service. So there could be two different answers. If they're a services company, they will probably have the only option is to kind of uh, find a bank or an investor or for that matter, uh, something like a beehive who would actually fund the contract or look at the contract to look at it from that perspective which in case, if, depending on who they have the contract with, if it's a large company, some banks will actually fund that contract in the sense uh, separately from the company as a whole, like providing the, you know, the, 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 the customer pays to the bank first, the bank pay, takes its share and only passes on the rest to them. Those kind of models are possible to do. But again, here, you know, I find the confusion between them. These, these things usually happen with services rather than uh, startup companies building a product for that matter. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we have a, a question here, um, which I think Omar, I'll put this to you, I, I think, because maybe you've got an insight. It would be useful to know how many SMEs have gone bust and its impact on the overall business environment. I guess this must relate to sort of bank risk profiles and things. Uh, also, it would be great to understand the pricing differential between investment grade corporate and SME sub-investment grade uh, lending. So there's two questions in there, any sure. thoughts? Uh, on the first one, uh, I honestly don't have the data in terms of uh, okay. what the, the bus rate is. And it's probably hard to get that data because you'd have to kind of, kind of get some information from the, the companies that have gone bus to figure out whether they were SMEs or startups, et cetera. Um, but uh, on the second one, I would say, you know, the mezzanine market, uh, which is the sub-investment grade, uh, probably is priced at anywhere between 15 to 20% all-in returns. And that's uh, coming from a combination of cash interest, deferred interest, which is paid at the uh, end of the life of the loan, and uh, what we call uh, an equity kicker, a small amount that's linked to the actual performance of the company, either, you know, net earnings over that same, call it five-year window. Um, on, on the more investment grade, the higher quality stuff, um, I would say the range there is anywhere between 8 to 12%, depending on who the, the lender is um, and what kind of, is it a bank, is it uh, a different kind of uh, syndicate of private debt uh, providers, but that's roughly uh, an indication of where things today uh, probably stand. Okay, thank you very much. Now we've only got um, a few minutes remaining. Uh, we do still have uh, some questions to answer, but if you have any questions, get them in right now before we run out of time. Uh, Donna, if I can just come to you in a general sense, sort of for, for companies going forward who might be worried about cash flow issues, what would you say are the common errors or mistakes that you see from small and medium sized companies in terms of cash flow management? Yeah, cash flow is key so the things i would say are don't overspend people get excited and think oh i've got my own business and let's get the best table and chairs and car and all the things you don't actually need so it might look pretty but it's not going to give anything to you so one don't overspend with your cash flow two um do what you can yourself you don't need to employ four or five people straight up to say that you have a team you can do a lot of things yourself. Um, that's definitely how you save money. And if you don't know how to do it, learn and then employ somebody after that. 
Um, think outside the box a little bit with marketing. Marketing can spend a lot of money, especially digital marketing. So never underestimate word of mouth as well. So baby steps. And I have a saying, you know, if you spend, you can't save, but if you save, you can spend and you can spend later and you can grow. So it's all just about watching your spending and go and network. Networking is the way to build a business and just get out there. Don't, you know, it amazes me when people have ideas and they've got their own company, but they're too embarrassed or shy to tell people about it somewhere. I'm like, this is your company, guys. Love it. Breathe it. Like, you've got to give the energy for people. How is somebody going to want to believe in you if you don't believe in you? So Very they good. would be my key things of get out there, network, don't spend, or spend, but only what you need to spend. Yeah. And just think outside the box a little bit. Fantastic. Thank you, Donna. Uh, PK, I could see you nodding there. So I'm just going to put the same question to you, actually, about what are the sort of errors that you see from small companies and startups in terms of cash flow management? What advice would you well, give? Well, uh, you know, I would, I, would, I would actually emphasize what Donna said and add that, uh, you know, uh, you know, every penny saved uh, is, is penny earned in that sense. It, it, it's, it, it, it happens there. Also, remember, when you're doing an early stage company, you have to build a lot from nothing. In the sense, you build something out of nothing. There's a lot of stuff you build with sweat. There's friendships, relationships, you know, hustling around. You know, um, you know, there's so much amount of support in kind that is available from everywhere. From, you know, if you're in Dubai, go to Dubai Chamber of Commerce. You, you know, if you're in Dubai, go to the SME. Go to all these incubators, accelerators. Uh, you know, depending on the kind of company that you're in, go to the fintech high. Go here. There, you know, there are tons of places which all provide you value which put your startup or your idea far ahead. So do that. There's a lot to do there. Okay, thank you. Uh, just a couple of quick questions that have come in. Um, one for Omar, which follows on uh, from one of your earlier comments. Do you mean if it is operational renewables projects, your fund would consider it? So uh, yeah, following on yeah, earlier. Yeah, uh, so we, we invest in uh, existing businesses. We, we do not invest in startups or, or greenfield projects. Um, startups we would invest in in the later stages, Series B and above. Um, and in terms of renewable projects, if it's uh, existing and operational, uh, yes, we'll look at it. If it's uh, a greenfield, we, we would not. Excellent. Thank you. And quickly for Peter, uh, where was the question? There was a question just now about geographies. I can't find uh, it. I've been answering um, questions. I've been typing them in, so I've typed that in already. <laughs> sorry, say that again, Peter. I've been typing the answers to most of the questions that have been coming up, so <laughs> that's why. Oh, is that why it's disappeared? <laughs> so the que just quickly, so the questioner was asking about geographies. Do you operate outside the region? Just what, what, what's your... Uh, no, we don't. So we're, we're purely uh, UAE, Saudi, and we can do Bahrain as well, but those, those three only. Okay. Um, I'm afraid we've run out of time. Um, that has gone so quickly, and there are loads and loads of questions on my screen here that I haven't had a chance to get to. Um, I apologize if we haven't answered your question. I will circulate the, the questions with the panelists, but thank you for sending them in. It's been fantastic. Um, most important of all, thank you very, very much to our panelists. You've been absolutely wonderful today. Um, you've just taken everything and you've answered it and you've, you've given us your time and your knowledge. So brilliant job, well done. And thank you uh, to all four of you. Um, just before we, we, we finish, um, a couple of things to tell you about. I mentioned our SME Awards uh, 2021, the Gulf Capital SME Awards 2021. That is in November. You can see the screen in front of you. We are now open for entries. These are awards that we've been running with Gulf Capital for 10 years, and we are celebrating and recognizing the best small and medium-sized enterprises in the UAE um, you can find more on the, the website. There should be a pop-up link um, in the chat box. Let me just check if it's there. Uh, yes, it is. You can see in the chat box, there is a link uh, for entries. So get involved with that. And then one more slide, please, Nabil. Um, our next broadcast in the Gulf Capital SME Insights live series. So the, the second one after this is on digital transformation. We've heard today, or we've touched today on some of the uh, importance of digital transformation in the tech sector. Uh, this affects every company and is important, and in terms of cash flow management, very important. Um, 3rd of August, that is a Tuesday, 1 o'clock UAE time or Gulf Standard Time, uh, 3rd of August, digital transformation. You can register now and, again, be 
uh, link to register for that is in the chat box as well. So there are two links for you in the chat box. Um, and I think that's it for today. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been great to have you. Uh, wonderful questions. And I look forward to seeing you all uh, on the 3rd of August. Thank you very much. Thank you.